Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today on containers for the virtualization admin. I'm Chris Hines. I'm joined today with Mike Coleman, who's a tech evangelist here at the company. So, Mike, thanks for being here. Happy to be here, Chris. Awesome. Um, so, before we kick things off, I just wanted to let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded. So, um, probably mid next week, what we'll do is we'll follow up via email and include the link to the recording. So, you can go ahead and check it out again and share with anyone that you like. Also, towards the end of this presentation, we'll save some time for some questions and answers. So if you have questions, um, you can use the portal here within WebEx to ask questions within the Q&A section. All right, so today we're going to talk about containers, how they're different from VMs, and how you can leverage the power of containers and VMs together. So here at Docker, we're at the heart of what's being called the containerization movement, all right? Um, we started as an open source company in 2013. Um, today we have about two and a half billion image pools from our registry, uh, 2,500 contributors, and 400,000 doctorized applications. Um, but we've also created some commercial solutions as well. Um, we call that um, part of our Docker containers as a service platform, right? And we've built this platform that's built both for developers looking to build applications and IT ops teams looking to uh, manage and secure their environment. But really what it comes down to is that we're trying to make it really easy for companies to build, ship, and run their applications anywhere by leveraging the power of containers. So today we're going to talk about infrastructure optimization with Docker. And that includes three things, right? Agility, portability, and control. So when we talk about agility, we're talking about improving the process for um, provisioning Docker installed infrastructure, the speed at which applications are being built, and the actual performance of the workloads that you're running. From a portability standpoint, there's a huge benefit uh, when you start leveraging the power of containers, right? And the ability to migrate workloads from um, one environment to another across different platforms, um, and having that code work exactly the same way and cutting out that friction that has existed in the past. From a control standpoint, it really comes down to uh, maintaining the cost of your infrastructure, right? Reducing those capital expenditures and those operating expenditures as well by leveraging containers. But what exactly is containerization? All right, that's the, the question of the day for the folks who aren't familiar with what containers do. All right, so containerization leverages the kernel within the host operating system to run what's called root file systems, okay? So these root file systems are what we call containers. What containers do is they take an application and everything that it needs to run and wraps it in this standard format, right? And containers can run in any environment because of that standard format, right? Within a virtual machine or on a bare metal server as well. Each container has its own set of processes, memory devices, and its own network stack as well. So here's a look at the architecture of a container. You have the physical server, you have the host operating system running on top of that, and then you have the kernel within that operating system. Right? So containerization leverages this kernel. And as you can see in this diagram, these are three separate applications. In each container, you have the application and everything it needs to run, right? it's binaries. They're completely isolated, so each of these applications running on the server actually aren't aware of each other. Okay? But before we talk more about some of the differences between containers and virtual machines, there's key terms and definitions that you should be aware of. First is the Docker image. So the Docker image essentially is a snapshot of an application. It's how an application should be built, and it, it also serves as the basis for the container. The Docker container, which we just talked about, is that standard unit, right? It's where the application and its binaries reside. The Docker engine is super important, right? So the Docker engine is the Docker installed software. It's the thing that actually gets installed in the VM or in the bare metal server. It also creates and runs the containers themselves. The really cool thing about this engine is that it's super deployable and super flexible. It can run within a physical or virtual environment or a cloud service provider as well. Then you have the registry. So the registry is where the image content is actually being stored. In this case, we'll talk about Docker trusted registry. Uh, this is our on-premises registry for storing and securing the image content itself. We also have Docker Machine. Docker Machine is the technology that actually goes and provisions the Docker installed infrastructure on that bare metal server or within that VM. Um, for those of you who have heard of Swarm, right, we did something called Swarm Week earlier this week, and Swarm is our tool for clustering uh, Docker engines. Um, and it's actually embedded into one of our commercial products called Universal Control Plane, which we'll show you today as well. 
Um, Universal Control Plane is our on-premises solution for managing, deploying, and scaling applications across the different Dockerized node clusters. And then lastly, we have Compose. Docker Compose is also built into Universal Control Plane, and what that allows you to do is deploy multi-container applications. So, one big thing that I need you to realize here is that containers are not VMs, right? They're architecturally different. So containers are shared resources. We talked about how they share the kernel within the host operating system. Um, because they don't have an entire guest operating system within them, they're super lightweight. And because they're lightweight, they can actually spin up faster. So they have faster instantiation times in VMs. There's also no hypervisor required when you leverage containers. Um, and they're built for both microservices and monoliths. So this is actually a really big misconception. Um, at HP Discover, I talked with a developer um, at the booth, and he mentioned that he wants to start leveraging containers, but he had heard that it's only used for microservices applications only, and he has legacy apps that he doesn't think he can uh, dockerize in any way. And that's completely incorrect, right? You can containerize both legacy apps as well as microservices um, in addition to that. So then you have virtual machines, right? So virtual machines, I'm sure um, a lot of you on this, um, in the audience are actually familiar with already, right? These are isolated resources. They all have their entire uh, full operating system and their service within that, um, which is why they're much more heavyweight than a container. And that sometimes they take seconds or even minutes uh, to boot up, right? These are, again, enterprise based so you have uh, licensing costs that are, you know, associated with virtualization. Um, no underlying OS, and these are typically used for monolithic applications, not microservices applications as well. So here's a look at the different architectures when you start comparing containers and VMs. On the left, you have containerization. All right, you have the infrastructure, the operating system, the Docker engine that actually installs on this OS, and as you can see, you have three completely different applications, App A, App B, and App C. So each of these are running in this container. You have the application and its binaries. Realize how there's no hypervisor here, and these are completely isolated and different applications. So you can run multiple apps on a single operating system. On the right side, you have virtualization. So you have the physical server, you have the hypervisor, which creates and manages the VMs, and you have the actual isolated VMs themselves. So notice how on each VM, you have the app, the binaries, and an entire guest operating system. Right, so this is super heavyweight. The huge difference here is that there's an operating system within the VM, not within a container. And because of that, containers are way more lightweight. It's also important to realize that containers and VMs are not mutually exclusive. You can actually start leveraging them together. So on the left side, you have a diagram that looks very similar to what we just saw. This is if you were to utilize containerization um, in a data center or on a bare metal server. So again, you have the physical server, the operating system, the engine, and then you have the multiple containers, the applications that are containerized running on that engine. On the right side, you have containerization and VMs together. But look what happens when you introduce containerization and VMs. You have your physical server, your hypervisor, but if you look in that first virtual machine on the left, app four and app five are actually containerized. So on that one operating system, you're actually running multiple applications within that VM. This is much different from typically where you're leveraging one operating system and only one application within a VM. So already, as you see, if you start leveraging containers and VMs, you can optimize, consolidate, and actually reduce costs while actually running more services um, within your VM. So look at the before image on the top left corner there. You see uh, virtualization, right? You have these isolated resources, the app, the binaries, and operating systems, right? One service and operating system per VM. But after you introduce containerization, you have one container per service, right? So you can containerize each of these services and then run multiple containers within that VM. So when you use them together, you can optimize your environment, you can consolidate, right? Leverage less VMs to run more applications. And because of this, you're able to reduce costs, right? Think about the cost of um, maintaining those VMs, uh, the storage costs associated with that, right? Your storage folks are going to love you because what you're actually doing is getting back more, more space. You're doing more with less. You also have the ability to migrate workloads anywhere, right? Again, it comes down to that standard format and the, the portability that containers provide. So if you're using solely a virtual machine, let's say you have a workload running in uh, VMware vSphere and you try to migrate it over to um, Azure, 
get unable to do that because VMs are proprietary formats. But if you leverage containers, things change, right? Since Docker abstracts above that VM layer, you can actually take that workload that's running in VMware vSphere and migrate it over to Azure and have it run the exact same way. Right, there's absolutely no recording that's necessary and no conversions or anything like that you, that you would have to leverage if you were trying to uh, utilize solely VMs. So you have the standardization of the, that the Docker format provides. You have the portability and the ability to move workloads to different environments without that friction. And you have what's called lift and ship. So we talked about before how containers aren't only used for microservices applications. What we've also seen is folks are containerizing legacy applications so they can benefit from that portability that containers provide. And the thing is, you wouldn't be the first to do this, right, to combine the powers of containerization and virtual machines. We actually worked with a company called Swisscom. Uh, Swisscom is the largest telecom provider in Switzerland. And they actually saw a 20 to, to 1 VM consolidation ratio, right? They went from running 400 virtual machines down to 20 VMs running the same amount of applications, right? So think about all the costs that they were able to save there, going from 400 to 20. Storage costs, um, the cost of actually managing those VMs as well. We also have a large, uh, a leading energy company. Now, I can't say the name here, but I can say that it's a household name. You're probably all very aware of who that is. Um, what they did was they decided to containerize their legacy applications and again, benefit from that portability that we talked about. So what they're able to do is move their entire cloud to data center site, perform an entire cloud to data center site um, in a migration that only took five months. And what they're able to do is accelerate the release processes for their applications. So when it comes down to it, you can do more, migrate, optimize, and reduce costs with containers and VMs together. So why Docker, right? Why would you start leveraging containers? It's because now, you can run any app and any stack in anywhere. So the question that you shouldn't ask now is what's the difference between containers and VMs, but it's how can you start leveraging the powers, the power of containers within your environment? So I want to talk about Docker containers as a service. Right? And here's what the workflow actually looks like. Right? We talk about build, ship, run. This is the handoff between developers and IT operations and the, the extreme and the complete workflow that would take place from taking an application from creation to deployment. So on the build side, you have an, a developer is using laptop to build the application. Right? They could be using Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows or Docker Toolbox to create that application. Uh, what they do is they then create an image. Right? Again, the image is a snapshot of that application. That image has to be stored somewhere. So what they do is they push it to a registry. Right, Docker Trusted Registry in this case. This is where the image is stored, it's secured, right? there's a signing technology as well, so you can ensure that you're running the latest version of an image in production and ensure that's not being tampered with. This also serves as the interchange point between the developer who's already created the app and the IT operations team member who's looking to pull that app and then run it in production. When they're running to, ready to run, you use Universal Control Plane to pull that image out of the registry and then run it in production um, whether in the cloud or in the data center, right? Again, benefiting from that flexibility that containers provide. You also have the ability to migrate those, work, those workloads between the cloud and your data center environments. So you're not locked into any kind of infrastructure, which is typically the case with uh, a VM. So here's a look at our Docker containers as a service platform, right? We call it Docker data center. Notice here that everything in the blue is part of our Docker solution set and the green is the pluggability, right? All the different plugins that are available. We built this platform to be super pluggable. We realized that enterprises already have existing infrastructure in place, and our goal isn't to ask them to take that out and ship it away, but instead, it's to plug into it. So uh, with Docker Data Center, you're getting Docker Trusted Registry, right? the on-premises registry for storing the apps. You're getting the container runtime, which is the engine. Um, the good thing about Docker Data Center is that it actually comes with support, right? So you have support from the Docker team in terms of hot fixes and patches for that engine. Orchestration, leveraging Swarm as well as Compose. Again, Swarm is that Docker engine clustering tool we talked about earlier, and Compose is that tool that enables you to deploy multi-container applications. From a security standpoint, we build end-to-end -end security for the content, the platform, and the access to that content. 
We have tools like Docker Content Trust. We have role-based access controls built into it, integration with LDAP and AD and single sign-on with DTR, and then Universal Control Plane. Uh, Universal Control Plane is our management layer. This is the thing that helps you manage, deploy, and scale your applications across your Dockerized node environment. And then we have the plugins, right? Multiple plugins. I won't go into each of these, um, but you know, plugins with like Cisco, um, Splunk, et cetera. And again, the ability to run on any infrastructure, right? And the magic sauce behind that is the Docker engine itself. The ability to run in a public cloud, in a virtualized environment, or on a physical or converged infrastructure as well. It's available as a subscription, all right, business day or business critical. Um, in each case, you're getting universal control plane, trusted registry, and support for the Docker engine. And if you want to try it out, you can do a free trial of that today for 30 days. At this point, what I'll do is I'll transition it over to Mike, who's going to show us a demo of a full app lifecycle from idea to deployment. So, Mike, let me click out of this, stop sharing, and I'll pass you the ball. All right, let me go in here and uh, share my desktop. No, if I hit it twice, I'm going to hit it twice. There, you can see my desktop. <laughs> All right, so as Chris said, we're going to go through and we're going to take a look at Docker in action, kind of go from this idea of how does an application, you know, how does a developer go and do their work and, and take an app from an idea um, into production and going through that build, shift, run process, right? So we're going to talk about building right now. And what we're using today is something called Docker for uh, Mac. And so if I say Docker version, you can see that I'm running here. Um, and what Docker for Mac does is it allows a developer to create Docker uh, images uh, here on their, on their uh, on my case, on my MacBook. We also have Docker for Windows. So if you're a Windows user, don't fret. And we also, um, if you're a Linux user, then you can just install Docker natively. So what I've been working on is a spiffy little app. Um, it's a Python app. And it basically takes random images and updates a URL with them. So I'm working on this app, and I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, I've already been working on it. I've built a Docker image for it. So I'm just going to go ahead and run that app. And Docker run, I'm going to run the background. That's what D stands for. And I, my app runs on port 5000. And so I have to map that port onto my host. So any request coming in on port 5000 on my host will be routed into my container. Um, I'm, because I'm working on the app, I'm actually going to mount my source code directory into um, the running container. And you'll see why when we get further into the demo. Little mistake here. There we go. And I'm going to say Mike G. Coleman. CatWeb. Now, what that is, that is a Docker image that already has um, uh, that is a Docker image that I've already uh, uh, built earlier, and we'll we'll rebuild it so you'll see how we got to that point. But for this point, what we're going to do, like I said, we're going to start up the app. We're going to run it um, here on my local machine. So we'll hit um, yeah. We're going to put in the actual command to run it. And then we can actually run it. So there we go. I left the run command out. And now you saw that fire up there in about um, half a second. That was what Chris was talking about, some of the speed of Docker container. So what we did there is we instantiated the running web server on my MacBook in about a half a second. So if I come over here to my web browser and I go to localhost 5000, what you're going to see is just a random cat gif. So if I cycle through this, um, you can see that it just loads up a random cat GIF every once in a while, um, and they're random and they're awesome. Except for that, that one is not awesome. It's broken. Um, anyway, okay. <laughs> so let's go back here. Now, what you notice there is that this is the totally random cat GIF or GIF of the day. So I'm going to go in, and remember I mounted my source code directory um, with this line right here? So what I can do is using the local Mac file system and using whatever tools I would normally use as a developer, right? So in my case, my favorite IDE of all times is VI. Um, I don't need anything like Eclipse or Visual Studio. I just need VI. And I'm going to come down in here, and actually, um, I want to actually edit the web page template. It's just easier to make something show up. So um, I'm going to go ahead to right here, and I'm going to say Chris's totally random cat gif of the day. 
And if I come back to my running host and I reload it, you can see that that change is uh, immediately reflected, even though I'm not sure I should have the SF or the apostrophe, but um, I always get confused on that rule. So, um, so what we did there is, as a developer, I could be working on my code, I could be um, modifying it, sort of any, as the way I normally would, and you can see it change immediately reflected in the container. Now, I'm feeling pretty good about where we're at on that application. So I'm gonna go ahead and build out a new image that we can then push up to our registry server and deploy into production. But let's step back and understand how images get built. So I have something called a Docker file. Now a Docker file, if you look at it, um, if you're a Python developer, you're like, wait a minute, that looks really familiar. But if you're not a Python developer, um, I'll explain to you kind of what you're seeing. So we always start with the base image. And in this case, we're starting with the Alpine Linux image. So what we're saying is our, our, our container is gonna include whatever Alpine Linux includes by default. Now, I could build this image from Ubuntu or Red Hat or CentOS. And regardless of where I, uh, the operating system uh, parameters I provide for my Docker container, it has no effect on where that ends up running. So I could say from Red Hat latest and deploy my container onto CentOS or Ubuntu or Alpine or even a Raspberry Pi running some ARM-based version of Linux. That's the beauty of that portability. And we'll see that as we deploy into production. So that's what that first line is. The second is, I'm just telling, uh, I'm telling Docker in my new container, go ahead and install Python and pip. Uh, pip is the package manager for, for, for Python. Um, we're gonna make sure that those are up to date with this upgrade command here. And then we're gonna go ahead and copy in um, our requirements. So for Python developers, requirements.txt is simply a text file that lists all the uh, different packages that we need for our application. And so I'm copying that from my local machine to the user source app directory. And if you remember back, that's the same directory that I mounted in that initial run step, right? So that's my source directory for my application in my container. After I copy requirements.txt, I'll use pip to install the requirements that are detailed out in that file. Then I'll copy in my application source code into that same directory. And then I'm gonna copy my index.html file back over into that, again, that same directory. So what I've done there is I've installed Python, I've installed all my requirements, I've installed my source code. That's what Docker does, right? You get just what you need for your applications. That Alpine image is really small, it's about six megs. When we're done and we build my, my web application here, it'll be about 65 megs. Um, uh, can anybody else see my desktop? Diego just told me he couldn't. I can see it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so it looks like, it looks like Diego, that might be on your side. Um, other people can see it. Um, so, um, so then what we're gonna do is, uh, remember I told you my application runs on port 5000, so I tell Docker to expose that, and then when the container starts up, it's gonna run Python, and it's gonna run that source code we just copied in. So that's what a Docker file is. That's how you describe a container. Um, so, I'm gonna come out here, I'm gonna quit out, and since we're in the build step, we're gonna use docker build, and I'm gonna give it a name, and, and so what I've done is, Mike G. Coleman is my username up on Docker Hub, and CatWeb is the name of my image, and 2.1, um, 2.1.1 is the version number. Um, I'm gonna use a period to tell Docker to build the Docker file, uh, build the image based on the Docker file in the current directory. So, we'll hit enter. You'll see it run through those steps. Now, it was pretty fast because I was updating an additional image, uh, an existing image already on my machine. If I'd been building that image from scratch, you would have actually seen it run out and do everything that was listed in that Docker file in a very verbose manner. So. I built a new image. Now I'm going to push that image up to Docker Hub. So Docker push, and this is that ship phase. So Docker push, Mike G. Coleman slash CatWeb, 2.1.1, and this takes a couple seconds. So while that's happening, uh, I'm gonna come over here to the web browser and I'm gonna show you Docker Hub. <laughs> Docker Hub is 
uh, the uh, what we call a, a registry, um, and it's SAS based. Now we have a SAS based registry, Docker Hub. We also have Docker Trusted Registry, which you can see highlighted over here on the side, which is an on premise registry. And the purpose of a registry is to simply give you a place to house all your Docker images. So here are all my images, right? And let me tab back here real fast. You see, CatWeb is done, it's been pushed. So if I come in here to CatWeb, and I click on tags, which is what we call that, you can see 2.1.1, that's the version that I just pushed. So it's been up there for, uh, you know, just a few seconds. There's all kinds of images up here. We mentioned there's images for Ubuntu, right? There's images for, and Chris talked about Swisscom and MongoDB. Um, there's an official MongoDB image. There are, um, what else, um, WordPress, for instance. So you have both sort of full-blown applications as well as um, sort of services to make up those applications. Um, you know, if you want to do a Node.js Node application, right? There's actually even a Python image. So if I didn't want to install Python in my image, if I just wanted to start with an image that I already had Python installed, um, I have a Python image right there. So I could have built that last Docker file by saying from Python, and all I would need to do is copy in my source code. I wouldn't need to install Python. All right, so the... Everything we've shown you up to this point is either open source or free. You can create a hub account for free. There are paid accounts that give you things like uh, private repositories and the ability to build teams and groups um, and lock down your, your uh, images. Um, what I'm gonna show you now is uh, our on-site CAS platform, uh, containers as a service platform. This is Docker Universal Control Plane. And Docker Universal Control Plane runs in your data center or in your private cloud. Um, and what it does is it manages Docker containers and applications and um, the infrastructure they run on. So you can see here that I've got three applications running, 14 containers. I pulled down 24 images. I only have one node in my cluster. Um, over here, I can manage Docker volumes, Docker network, Docker images, users and teams set up role-based access control, um, all kinds of different things. But for this example, what we're going to do is I'm going to deploy a container. So um, deploy container and give it the image name, Mike G. Coleman, slash cat web version 2.1.1. And we come down here. Remember, we had to do that network thing. So I have to do the same thing here. Port 5000 um, goes to the host 5000, and I click run container. And what it's doing now is it's going out and it's pulling the CatWeb cat web image off of Docker Hub, and it's bringing it down onto my host that I'm managing um, uh, with Docker Universal Control Plane, and it's creating that new container. So that'll take a couple of seconds um, to run through. And you can see now the container is successfully deployed. So a couple of things. I can actually go into this container now. If I, you know, now we're sort of in that run perspective. Now I'm, I've gone from being a developer to being an operations guy. I can restart this container. I can stop it. I can scale it up. Let's say all of a sudden CatWeb becomes the hottest thing on the internet and people are dying for their cat gifts. We can scale this up. We can say, you know what? We need 10 CatWeb gifs. <laughs> Throw that behind a load balancer and we'd be off running. I can rename it, I can remove it. Additionally, here's all the details about the configuration, right? What, what node it's running on, what volumes it's using, any labels we've applied, networking information, IP address, port assignments, and the actual process running. Um, I can look at that, I can take a look at the logs, right? So um, we can just see that my cat web is up and running and it's running on port 5000, there's no errors. We can go into statistics, to look at um, CPU utilization, uh, memory utilization, network utilization. CatWeb is obviously not a super intense app. It's just using a little bit of RAM here, um, but hardly no CPU and no network yet of any measure. And then console, I can actually, if I want to, go in and shell into the running container. So if I do a PS here, um, you can see I'm actually in the container, and you can see that process one inside my container is in fact um, my application that I started. So, um, disconnect out of the shell there, and let's come over here. So if I grab this address, and I control C that, and I control V it here, and I go to port 5000, um, 
There's Chris's rat, totally random cat gif. Now, that example looks really simple. Like, you're like, well, I don't get it. Like, what happened? What is wrong with this image? Oh, you know what? It didn't work because of this URL at the end. But if I take that URL out, you can see this cat. <laughs> anyway, that was supposed to be a joke, but it didn't work. Uh, that, for all of you, uh, there, that is Chris Hines, featured Bloomberg Business Week, talking about his fashion. I love it. All right, anyway, so that was supposed to be one of the images that ran and popped up and I screwed it up. I apologize. Anyway, it's easy because of what, you know, how it, it, it's, it's, it could be easy to overlook what we just saw, but I want to point it out. What we did is we built a Python application on my MacBook, and then we are now running it on Amazon Web Services in, on an Ubuntu VM with no modification. And that's what Docker does. I could easily push that same Python application out to a vSphere VM, a Hyper-V VM, a physical server running Linux, anything. Um, when Windows Server 2016 ships, you'll be able to do the same thing for Windows applications. You'll be able to create Windows containers and move them around between Windows hosts just as easily. So imagine you're an ops guy, and I don't know how many people are ops on the call and how many people are, are developers. Um, we did build this as virtualization admins. Your virtualization admin, and my background is six years at VMware before I, I joined here at Docker. Um, when somebody came up to you and said, hey, virtualization admin with your 1,000 VMs, we want you to put all of those VMs up on AWS. That's a lot of work. That's a ton of work. And, and as you can tell by the, the um, energy example that we gave, that's where Docker can really help. If you had to do that migration, you could easily convert the workloads into containers and move them around seamlessly. Virtual, virtual hosts are a great place to run your containers. Um, and, and, you know, I, I chuckle when I hear pundits say, oh, Docker, you're going to destroy VMware. I think that, that VMware um, and the vSphere platform uh, are incredible pieces of engineering. I think that containers run really well on vSphere, and I think that's a great place for them to run. Um, what we want to enable is just the choice. Um, we were at, I was at HP Discover last week, and um, Dropbox talked about how they had migrated out of the public cloud back into their data center. Right, so that sort of freedom of movement is what we're talking about. They didn't do that on Docker, but just that, just that movement is what I'm talking about. Being able to facilitate that. So I want to show something else real quick, since we have a little bit of time. We did the, um, we did, uh, we did the the um, single, you know, a single. A simple app that is a single container is what I'm trying to say, which I'm not being able to say. Um, but what do you do if you want to deploy a multi-tier app, right? So we've got one here, and we have a file called Docker Compose. And we talked about Compose a little bit. What Docker Compose does is it allows you to define um, it allows you to define uh, a multi-tier application. So in this case, our application has, again, a Python-based uh, web front end called Food Trucks, but it also uses Elasticsearch on the back end, right? And so what Docker Compose does, it allows you to define these complex applications. So we're gonna pull these two images down um, and we're gonna link them together, right? And um, we're gonna go ahead and run that. Oh. Okay, hold on. There we go. And so what I do is I can come back into Universal Control Plane, and here I can deploy an application as opposed to a single container. So if I come in here to Compose Application, and I give it a name, and I can come over here, and I can upload an existing Compose file, and I'll just click that one that we were just looking at. And again, we're going to pull down the Elasticsearch engine, we're going to pull down the food trucks image, and we're going to expose port 5001, in this case, um, mount a volume, and link the Elasticsearch container and the web container together. So if I click Create, um, you can see out there, it's going to take a couple seconds for this to happen, um, but um, we will, the application will be up and running. So it's creating the food truck um, and the web interface, and then it successfully deployed it. So click done. 
So now if we come back over here, you can see here's food truck, and we've got two of these running. So if the demo gods are with me today, and some days they are not, um, we should see a food truck application come up here. Oh, they are not with me today. Oh, you know what it is? I know what it is. I'm sorry. I uh, used the wrong port. Um, on our AWS instance, my security group is not open for port 5001. So I tried to kind of go off the cuff there a little bit. So if I just do this and I remove, and boy, I hope that was the problem because if it wasn't, um, and I come back in here and I say food trucks and I open this back up again. Wow, demo guys really don't like me today. Uh, okay, well, let's pretend that worked. Well, give me a second. I can make it work. I can, I'm not giving up, Chris. Don't give up. Try, I have faith in you. Quit trying to make me give up. <laughs> do we have any questions while I do yeah. something really quick? Yeah, I'll take some. Um, so one question we got, and I'll take this on Mike as you handle that. Um, I'm assuming Docker containers can be created on AWS. If so, can we seamlessly port from AWS to Azure? The answer to that is yes. You can definitely port from AWS to Azure. Um, is Docker a type of container? Yeah, so yes. Um, let's see. Can we run Docker on VMs and use containers to withhold our applications? Absolutely. Yes, you can. We talked about the integration between leveraging containerization and VMs together and how when you introduce containers, you can run multiple applications on a single VM versus just one app um, per VM. So I'm ready to jump back in. Cool. So what I did is I, I was able to copy and paste that in, um, and I'm changing it to port 8000. So if I click Create here, um, we should come up. You know, Chris is like looking at me like, why are you trying to just like ad hoc your demos? We didn't rehearse this. Why did you put that picture of me in there? <laughs> So uh, food, food truck, web truck, <clears throat> um, deployed food truck. So, so I want to say something real quick. That question about is Docker a type of container? A lot of people come up to me and say, well, containers have been around for a long time. There's LXC and there's, there's BSD jails or zones and Solaris Jones or jails or whatever. Um, yeah, they've been around for a long time. Docker is more than just containers though, right? So even when you're talking about the open source project, right? Docker is about containers, but it's also about uh, managed storage volumes. It's also about Docker created networks. It's also about um, Compose and applications. So yes, Docker includes containers and there is a Docker container, but the container format has actually been opened through the Open Container Initiative, right? And so um, what we committed to last year was we were not gonna get into this silly format war that you saw with other technologies. So um, if you, if, if you're, uh, you know, uh, if it's an OCI run uh, compliant container, it can run on a bunch of different platforms. And Docker is an OCI runtime format or OCI compliant format. So let's see, oh my goodness. Something is not going right for me today. Uh, all right, I don't know what happened, it worked yesterday. It, it's, now it's failing. I don't know. I give up. Chris. It's all good. No, it's it's not. It's angry. Uh, it's making me angry. Um, anyway, let's, uh, so that's the. I hate to end on that note with the demos, but um, I guess we are. So go ahead and uh, any more questions? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. And I'm not giving up on this, but I can answer questions and work on it at the same time. <laughs> um, okay. One question is. Um, well, we got this question again. Can we host multiple containers on a single VM? Yes, absolutely, you can do that. Um, so from a performance optimization perspective, is it recommended or possible to specify the locality of physical servers for Docker containers within VMs? Uh, the locality of physical servers of Docker, there's a lot of stuff going on there. I'm not sure exactly what's being asked, but I'm going to try to answer it. And if my answer is not what you're asking, then um, please feel free to uh, um, clarify. But so what we can do is using um, something called Docker Swarm, which is what Universal Control Plane is based on. Docker Swarm allows you to take a bunch of hosts, right? And they could be mixed hosts. You could have some VMs, you could have some Linux, you could have some Windows, you could have some AWS, you could have some Azure, um, and they could all be part of the Swarm cluster, right? 
and, the, and, and they're all part of the swarm, and they're hanging out. And when you start a VM, one of the things that we looked at in these containers, I'm going to bring this up real fast just as an example. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Hold on. Uh, let me go back to sharing my screen. Um, so um, back here, we look at these things called labels, right? You can apply labels to containers and to hosts. And so you can say, when this container starts, it has to go on a physical host, or it has to go on an AWS host, or it has to go on an AWS host in the East region that uses SSD. You can literally apply, you know, an infinite number of labels and use those labels to direct where um, where containers get started up. You can also do things, you can do things um, called affinities too, which says start this container on the same host as this other container, right? So there's a number of different ways to control the way um, uh, containers are scheduled. And that's what Swarm is, right? Swarm is clustering and scheduling. And so the scheduling component, I think, gets to what the, uh, the, the person was asking in that question. Okay. Another question I got was, does Docker Engine uh, run on bare metal? Yes, absolutely. Docker Engine runs on any Linux operating system with a modern kernel, whether that's physical, virtual, you know, I mean, Raspberry Pi is physical, but it's vastly different than Cisco UCS, and it will work on both of those. Sweet. We got a question. Is Swarm like Kubernetes? Is Swarm like Kubernetes? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, in a regard. I mean, Swarm, so Swarm, um, Mesos, uh, Mesos and Marathon or Mesosphere together, Rancher, uh, Universal Control Plane, which is, you know, which is based on Swarm. Um, yeah, they're, they're all similar. They all do roughly the same thing, which is scheduling and clustering, right? Um, they do them slightly different. Um, so, for instance, uh, Mesosphere does both containers and uh, 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 and sort of traditional workloads, where Swarm is really just been built from the ground up to work on containers. Containers was added to Mesosphere um, at a later date. Kubernetes um, doesn't – it runs containers, but it doesn't maintain the native Swarm CLI or the native Docker CLI and the native Docker APIs. It kind of takes containers and you do everything the Google way, which is not – I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. I'm just saying it is what it is. Um, so, um, yeah, they're, they're similar in the sense that they are, all those systems are designed to um, group together groups of servers and make sure that your containers are up and running and managing that state for you. One question again, this is actually this is a really good question. Is there a limit on how many services you can run through Compose? Um, I guess there's a theoretical limit somewhere. I don't know. I don't know. The, I mean, the most I've ever seen in a composed application is about five or six, but I'm sure there could be more. Um, I don't. I don't know that there's a hard limit anywhere. Okay. Another question we got. Um, um, does Docker Data Center have a CLI interface as well? Yeah, absolutely. And the CLI interface is the native Docker interface. So um, I'm trying to do food truck again because I will not give up while I'm talking to you. Um, and again, it tells me it's successful again, but I'm sure it's lying to me. Um, let me go here real fast. And you're seeing my – oh, you guys are watching me trying to get food truck running. Um, if I come down in here, there's this thing called um, – in my profile – there's a thing called Create Client Bundle. And what, client, what the Client Bundle does, if I download that onto my local machine um, and I run it, it allows me to execute using my MacBook against the, um, against the remote host. So I have this Client Bundle, and I'm going to open that. And there's, there it is. So I'm going to take and put that in my home directory. and source env.sh, and if I say docker run, so I say docker ps, um, you can now see uh, all the things running on my UCP controller, right? You can actually see that it's my UCP controller here by the, um, the name UCP controller. So now I'm operating against my UCP controller. So if I, for instance, was to say real fast, docker run um, name mic, Busy box top. Oh. Uh, let me do that again. I'm going to call it Chris. 
and let's run in the background. That's why it showed up on my screen, so I didn't run up in the background. Okay, so now if I go back to the UCP console here and I go to containers, there's that, those are those two containers that I just started, right? So I use the command line to start con um, containers up in, um, up in UCP. And when, for whatever reason, food truck is being finicky today, so I'm not gonna spend any more trouble, time troubleshooting it. Um, Chris, next question. Next question is, um, is it possible to isolate Docker container in a user-defined overlay network? Yeah, um, if, I, if I understand what you're asking, uh, yeah. So we basically have this ability to create overlay networks. And, and Docker does a bunch of different things with networking, but what an overlay network is, is, in our parlance, is a network that spans Docker hosts. So we have a whole webinar up on our website about networking that goes into all of this in detail, which, we can, which we'll link in the Q&A document when we, when we post this webinar up. But basically, um, what that allows you to do is define a network um, in between those hosts and attach containers to it. And you can define as many networks as you want, right? So you can have multiple overlay networks. And a container can, can belong to as many networks as, as it likes. Um, so you could have a front-end network and a back-end network, and your front-end network hosts your web interface. And in between the front-end and the back-end is a, is a proxy server running in a container and the back-end network has all of your databases and worker nodes. Um, so, yeah, you can absolutely create these overlay networks between hosts, and, um, and when you put containers on those, on those networks, they are only able to speak to the containers that they share the network with. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but that's my answer. Uh, another question I got. Does UCP have the ability to schedule containers based on CPU availability or memory? Um, we have a, yeah, we do. So when you, when you start a container, so let me go back to my world famous busy box example, because that's what I usually use. I can come down here in the container config and I can specify how much memory this container needs, right? So I could say this container needs 512 megs, right? And it needs two CPUs. Um, it will then go out and look at all of the resources in my in my in my cluster and find a cluster a, a machine that satisfies those constraints. So yeah, you can you it will it will do it that way. What it won't do is um, it will not look at available resources on all the nodes and find the least loaded server to put the, put it on. That we don't have the ability to do today. Um, we have three built-in ways to schedule things on Swarm with Swarm um, that, that uh, you know, as far as, as far as like, if I don't tell a container where to go, Swarm can do it automatically for me in one of three ways. It can do something called a spread strategy, which if you go to the dashboard, um, you can see that's what we're actually using. Here's a spread strategy. A spread strategy basically says um, randomly, not randomly, but on a round robin basis, deploy the container. So if I'm deploying three containers, on three nodes, you go container one on node one, container two on node two, container three on node three, and then if I deploy a fourth container, it'll go back to node one. So that's that's um, spread. If I if I pick bin pack, which is another way to do it, um, I'm going to fill up all of node one uh, with my containers until it doesn't fit anymore. Um, so in the case of, of the example I just gave, if the system was down to 256 megs of RAM and I start, tried to start a container that wanted 512, it's going to go to node 2. And then random is, as the name implies, random. Like, it'll just put the containers up wherever it feels like and just randomly picks a host and throws it out there. Okay. Thank you. Um, one is directed to you. Hey, hey Mike, I uh, changed the code of the application that exists in container and I run it without rebuilding the image. Will the changes get reflected? I mean, that's what we did. If I understand, read the question to me one more time, please. So this is a hypothetical thing. I change the code of the application exists in container and run it without rebuilding the image. Will the changes get reflected? Well, so the container is always running, right? And so if you do it the way I did it, um, yes. Depending on your, I mean, it all depends on your application, right? If there's a way to restart your application without restarting the container, then it should work, right? But in most cases, the application is started when the container starts. So, it would, you know, for the code to be reflected, you have to be able to restart your app 
that's why I do the, that's why I, when, when I do my demo, that's why I, I uh, modify the web page, because I, I don't have to restart the container, I can just reload the web page, right? So if there's a way to reinstantiate the code by, without restarting the container, then yes, absolutely. But remember that that, when that container goes away, so do those changes. That's also why I don't make the changes directly in the container. I make the changes on my uh, local development machine, develop machine that's mapped into the container. But I want to be able to, um, I want to be able to make sure those changes are static somewhere. Because something we didn't talk about is that containers are transient. And when a container goes away, everything that's in that container goes away. So if you were doing your code updates directly in your container and the container went away, um, you would lose them. So that's why I mount a volume, um, which is what that dash V was. I mount a volume to do that so I don't lose my changes. Thank you. Um, so this question is, is there anything that uh, that can clean up local Docker images which are not in use anymore? Maybe talk about garbage collection. Well, garbage collection, yeah, on Docker Trusted Registry, um, uh, you can go in. Um, the other thing you can do, right, is if you come down here and I just say, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, I guess fine, I don't care. It's a demo system and I'm not going to use it anymore. So Docker images, right, I've got a ton of images up here. Right, um, if I say Docker um, RMI, and then I say Docker uh, images-Q, that command there will delete every image that's not being used currently. If there is a container running that relies on that image, it will not remove that, con that image, right? So if I, if I want to remove everything because like, I'm just like totally, um, uh, reckless that I would put the dash F in there and that would force it and so every image would be deleted um, and it would destroy your running containers. But this should, in practice, um, not remove anything that doesn't have a container running, right? It should come back and it'll come back and actually error out on the containers that are running. Sweet. Um, okay. Is it possible to have a cluster made up of nodes on premises and nodes on AWS or Azure? Is it possible to create dynamically a new mode, a new node, if the already provisioned nodes are saturated or damaged? So all those errors you're seeing cannot cannot delete the image because it's a running container. So if I say Docker images, um, then I just have these are the containers. Like I'm running BusyBox, I'm using Worker, I'm using Nginx, I'm using all my UCP images. So um, that's why they're not failing. Although I think I deleted a, a UCP image. I highly don't recommend doing what I just did, actually. But someone asked if you could do it, that's one way to do it. Um, anyway, you were saying, what was your question? Yes. So is it possible to have a cluster made of nodes on premise and nodes on AWS or Azure? Yeah. One question. Okay. Second is, is it possible to uh, create dynamically a new node if the already provisioned nodes are saturated or damaged? Um, so, question number one, absolutely, you, uh, you can absolutely do that. Um, you just basically need to make sure you have the network connectivity between your on-prem solution and your cloud provider, so you have some sort of VPN that's established between them. Um, you know, and, and, and deploy a, uh, you know, use, use the high availability mode of Swarm and, and UCP to make sure that, um, that in case something goes down, your cluster doesn't die. And also be cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, you're going to be operating over a wide area network link and that you have the right bandwidth for whatever operations you're going to try to. So the second one, with, so separate the idea of infrastructure from the idea of containers. If a node is being saturated, if a node goes down, then we look at that, at the recreation of the node, as the responsibility of the infrastructure provider. We have some capabilities to provision infrastructure, but really, most people have tools to provision infrastructure. So for instance, Universal Control Plane doesn't provision infrastructure. So if you're running on AWS and your nodes are getting saturated, you would have those nodes in an auto-scaling group, and they would bring up a new Docker host, right? And then you're, that, would, that could be automatically added into the cluster. Right, um, and and that you know you can do that. You you can add nodes to the cluster and take them out. Um, if a node fails in a cluster, um, there is something called node failover, and all those containers will be restarted on a different host. But really, the the job of managing the infrastructure that containers run on, it, we kind of look at that as more more so being the job of the infrastructure providers. Thank you for that for attacking both of those. Uh, 
Another question, and I know we're coming up on the hour, so I'll try to get through maybe two more. Uh, can we update files and change directory permissions as needed inside the container? Uh, you can do whatever you want in a container, but again, if you don't do it via the image, then it's transient. Like, there are Docker files where you'll see Chamod and, um, you know, Chamod, however you say it, um, uh, and those sort of things. And that's part of an application installation process, right? So files will get copied in as part of the Docker file. The permissions on those files will be changed, and then the image is built, right? So, um, you know, I think I'm getting at your question, but, yeah, that can be done. And another question we got is, if everything associated with the container goes away when that image stops, what should we do with anything that needs to permanently store data? I can't believe it took us till three minutes left of the conversation <laughs> to answer this question. And I'm not mocking you because you've asked a question that is generally question two or three that I get asked when people, you know, people that are new to containers. The first question is, what is a container? And the second one is, well, what do I do? You just told me containers aren't persistent. What do I do with persistent data? So that's where Docker volumes come in, right? So Docker containers are built on something called, um, it's not a specific file system, but a concept called uh, union file systems, which is the ability, which is what we do is we layer up um, subdirectories to create a virtual file system for the container. But that, that virtual file system is shared across all containers running from that same image on a host. Um, and so that's why you can't just write randomly into the, into the image. Um, we create a read-write layer that's transient. It doesn't get saved off. So all of that exists sort of within this directory structure where Docker is storing the images in the containers. If you want to save anything, you use a volume. And a volume is just a subdirectory that exists outside of that structure I just mentioned. And so what you do is you say, look, anything written in the container to this directory um, gets written back out here. So in my example, um, uh, in my example before, where I was mounting my, my code into the container, it works both ways, right? I could create a file in there. Um, so if I come back here, and I run this. Oh. I'm not sure what I did there. Oh, I'm, never mind. I can't do it because I, I got to start a new shell. Hold on, because I'm pointing at the UCP controller. Uh, how much time we got? One minute? One minute. Unless some folks want to stay after a little while, which might be the case. Go ahead. Uh, oh, my goodness. Again. Um, okay. Uh, You trying to do the cat web thing? No, I'm doing something else. Okay. So, Clint, I don't think. Oh, we're going to get kicked out of here, though, is the problem. All right, we're getting kicked. Um, but anyway, what I want to show you is uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the net of the net is I was going to show you that I could go into a container, create a directory, and it would write on my local file system. Volumes is how you do that. And so um, that's how that works out. So, um, any other questions, or are we going to wrap it up? A bunch. I think we got to wrap it up here. So what we can do is we can follow up with you individually if you'd like to answer some of these questions. I know there's probably like another 15 or so questions. Um, and usually we do like a follow-up blog as well, so we can include those. But we'll make sure that we get your answers to you uh, in some way. All right, so first off, I just want to say thank you to everyone in the audience for being here. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to hear about containers for the virtualization admin. Hopefully that answers your question as to what the differences are between, between containers and VMs and um, how you can leverage the power of both of those together. Um, Mike, thanks so much for all the insight and your demos, man. Yeah. Hey, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. I really appreciate it. Uh, DockerCon next week, if you're there, I'll be in the hands-on labs all day for all, during the conference. Come say hello. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.